Okay, I will do a quick uh, overview of Fleshmanitis. I cannot talk on uh, each part of the world. I will focus uh, on, on VL, but initially I want to say it's very well known for each of you that uh, uh, Leishmanitis is a group of very diverse diseases, clinical uh, diseases. I just put here visceral, cutaneous, but less known is diffuse, cutaneous Leishmanitis. Some people from uh, South America, they know what I say. And especially mucocutaneous Leishmanitis, it's also uh, an entity well known in South America and Central America. And you have also post-scalar Zerberman Leishmanitis. You will see that I will focus part of my presentation on this post-scalar Zerberman Leishmanitis that was uh, focused on for, for years, but now it becomes more and more important. You will see why. And at the end, we have this co-infection, HIV Leishmanitis, that is also, unfortunately, an important problem in certain some, uh, some countries. The data you have below are not the current one. I put to, sh to show you the difference between when I was at WHO, we used to, to say that. 98 countries and they made uh, 1.2 million CL and uh, 0 0.3, even 0 0.5 million cases of VL in the world. Uh, you see that now the number are much more down and that's a part of the partly due to the success of the control activities in the countries, even if the job is not finished at all. <laughs> okay, here the illustration of uh, typical cases that you perfectly know. VL, that's a Bolivian case, the first one described in, in this country. Here you have the diffuse cutaneous leishmanitis with the multiple lesions and the absence of cellular mediated immunity that makes the case very difficult to treat. And here you have the mucocutaneous leishmanitis that people from Peru, Brazil, knows perfectly. And I put this case of PKDL, the first case of leishmanitis, is the uh, popular uh, form. You will see the importance to define uh, specifically the different clinical aspect in PKDL because they don't play the same role in the transmission. And you have here, the, the picture is not very good, but nodular form, um, that is uh, the most dangerous. We will see why. But also some, some years ago, we used to say that, um, that we have uh, between 50 and 90,000 cases per year of visceral leishmanazis. It's no more true, we have less now. Important thing that most of 50% of the cases, 30 of the cases are children. And that's the importance to target uh, children and for the treatment. 82 countries in the world, uh, the death is very difficult to, to give a right number because many people die with noti no notification. They die in the villages and nobody registers them in the official uh, data. Then the million of patients people at risk, it's a very approximate uh, estimate. Cutaneous leishmanitis also, uh, we work for many years around uh, one million. Unfortunately, it's still uh, it's not so much, but uh, it's still a very high number of cases. Of course, with less morbidity, less mo mortality, of course, compared to VL. But this uh, stigma, and that is important for daily life of the people reaching uh, this disease. In some Arabic countries of Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia, they used to call Leishmanitis, cutaneous Leishmanitis, little sister. I can say in Arabic, but I have heard that, that uh, in Arabic they call it, because it's so common that it's part of the family. You can get uh, so frequently Leishmanitis that it's part of your uh, con family context. Okay. Here is a case of mucocutaneous under treatment that you can see there. Okay, what's the main risk factor? It's classical for every form of the disease, clinical form. You have, of course, the urbanization that makes that many people move from the rural area to the suburbs of the city where the sanitary conditions are poor, generally, um, with difficult uh, collect of garbage, uh, open sewage, all the things that make easier to have a breeding site for the sunflies. Then you have the migration, 
the war, we see that in many countries, unfortunately now we have civil war and people uh, are moving uh, with no choice to go to certain places. For example, uh, we see the number that Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq have a very high number of uh, official cases actually. And it's no under control at all because the war and the disruption of the health care. Seasonal travels nomads, people from Sudan know perfectly, all the nomadic people that move from, from the south to the east of Sudan uh, with the cow to, to get uh, some uh, grass and uh, keeping the, the cow feeding. And they, in some places, they, they get leishmaniasis. Introduction of the vector, the reservoir, when the dogs move to one place to another with the people, you can reach a place where the transmission starts. And at the end, it's of course not a risk factor, so the contrary, it's so reducing the risk factor is the Calazar elimination program that is starting to, to give very, very good effect. Okay, I will uh, talk a little. I will not talk so much on Calazar because my colleague Greg will do it after myself. What's the current situation? Not exactly current because it's 2015, but it's not far away from uh, the current situation. We can say that we have three major foci for VL, hotspots, as he said that. One is the South America, especially Brazil. We, see, we will see that the epidemiology is very different from the Africa and Asia, because it's a zoonotic form with the dog as main reservoir. We will come back to that at the end. But the two main hotspots are East Africa and Indian subcontinent, uh, I mean India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and a little Pakistan. And Africa is, uh, of course, Kenya, is Sudan, is Somalia, Uganda, and um, Somalia is unfortunately increasing sharply because the civil war. Uh, that's a very close relationship when you disturb the, the system of control. Of course, the disease uh, goes up quickly. So we will see in the next slide that uh, there is a, a great change actually before the, the huge and the major focus for VL was this Indian subcontinent. Thanks to the Calata elimination program, it's going down quickly. And at the contrary, in Africa, the situation is worsening actually. And I talk on, on Somalia, that is a factor. For example, uh, now it's one of the six major countries reporting VI. Uh, in the past, it was Nepal, Bangladesh, but now Nepal and Bangladesh have reached the, the target of the el elimination program. Uh, next one. Oh. Here we, we reach data, more recent data. You will see the changes I just mentioned now. If you compare uh, 2004, 2008 to 2014, even 15 and 16, you will go with the tendency I just mentioned, East Africa increasing. Here he has doubled no, in between 2004 and 14. And uh, Indian subcontinent, at the contrary, the 42,000 to 10,000, even less now, we are down of, uh, we are 7,600, something like that, no? around 8,000 cases. So if you see the inverse process between the two areas in the world, and um, it's very interesting to see that uh, when you have a, a big initiative like uh, the Calata Elimination Program, uh, you can get a super method, even if the job is not finished. Here you see there are the WHO region that give a, an idea a little wrong <laughs> because uh, will show a certain uh, definition uh, by region. For example, in Emro, here, Eastern Mediterranean region, we have Sudan, because for political reasons, Sudan was dissociated from Kenya, Somalia, Uganda, and put with Emro. And in fact, to have the cases of East Africa, you have to add uh, those of really Africa and those part of those from Emro. At the contrary, it's very clear that CRO, as I said, uh, its Indian subcontinent has reached the point to less than 10,000 
Uh, that's a very updated data because they were published on October 4th, 2018. But I can get more <laughs> updated data. I'm pleased to say that. <laughs> Even if, uh, if it, they are published now, they are, they are from 2016. But that's not very, uh, there are not very big changes in this number you can rely on that. And AMRO, American con uh, region, is the Central and South America is very stable, 3,000, and the major component uh, of uh, AMRO is Brazil. That gives 95% of the cases from the American region. Here you see uh, some equilibrium. Just to define quickly um, what the two major epidemiological entities for VL, because I will be, be quite, <laughs> I will not take so much time on CL because we have no time. I, I really focus on VL because it's a killing disease which has a morbidity uh, high and uh, I think it's more important to, but cutaneous is still an important disease, but not uh, killing disease. But in the most of the Indian subcontinent, the great advantage that we, we have one single parasite is anthropognotic. There is no so far animal reservoir proven. Uh, the transmission is from man to man through the vector. We have the same epidemiology in India, Nepal, Bangladesh. Well, Sri Lanka is a special entity with cutaneous leishmaniasis in addition to VL. But globally, we have a very highly focused disease with family cases, the vector absolutely is close to the house and uh, you can have several cases in the same family that's typical of, of the peri intradomiciary transmission. At the contrary, when you have a selvatic transmission, it's completely different epidemiology. The vector is the phlebotomics absentee, there are only one vector and frequent epidemics with uh, dissemination of resistance. That's why uh, the elimination program of, for Calaza was started, initiated, because the epidemiology was in favor of getting good results. Uh, having one parasite, one vector, uh, mainly around the houses. At the contrary, if we go to, well, that's the environment in, that can be India, Nepal, Bangladesh, everywhere, with the habitat, with the cow, in the proximity of the house, the cow shed and, um, and the cow dung that are a superb uh, facility for the breeding site for the vector. That's been proven that the larvae of the sensei are present in the cow shed and uh, the proximity makes that it's very easy for the transmission to go from man to man. Here you see the mud houses, the cracks where the vector is. It's a typical uh, habitat for, for VL. Um, the straw in the roofs. And also, more important than the habitat, I think it's the economical level. Uh, most of the people live in the country, in the rural areas, with less than one US dollar per day. And I remember, it's not to, to make it pathetic, but uh, I, I will never forget that in VR one day, I told a, a young um, father that two of the children, his children had Kalaza and he cried. He cried, he said, because I have no money. I have no money for treatment, they will die. Now, that I have never forgot that because it was a pathetic situation to say, it's, it's fine, you, you make the diagnosis, you tell the guy, uh, your children have uh, such diseases and if you can treat them, of course, it's a, well, we, in that case, we save the situation, but uh, many, <laughs> places people uh, have no facilities. That's why the Calaza elimination program started in 2005, it was reviewed in 2015, and now the, the target is 2020. And the purpose is to reduce the incidence at the district level at the rate of less than one per 10,000 inhabitants. That's the, the idea. At that time, CRO had 69% of all the cases around the world. That was, that was CRO that was targeted for this initiative. I said before, what the, the factors make um, easy to take uh, that decision in terms of uh, 
probability of success, although initially very few people believe that could be a success. We have to be frank, even at the WHO. And that's also from October 2008. That's very interesting, in my opinion, to illustrate what I said just now. Is the, the blue line here is the Indian subcontinent. You see that in 2006, we were um, above 60,000. Even if we go before, we were at 70,000 cases per year. And you see now, we are at less than 10,000. But it's a fantastic, a drastic reduction of, of the cases. It's the unique place where we have seen that because the Calata elimination program. Uh, in other areas, you see the different colors down. It fluctuates, but there is no sharp reduction as in Asia. Even Afro goes down, go up, and uh, for the moment is going up. But you see, that's the main point I want to emphasize, is the drastic change in the perspective of VL around the world. Uh, it's shifting the priority. But we have not to shift the priority because the job is not finished with the Qatar image. A very strong message we have to deliver. Continue to fight, continue to put the, the, the control activities in place because we know that for any elimination program in the world, it's the last part, the most difficult because the politicians say, oh, that's control, let's go to another <laughs> priority. And for Chagas disease, people from South America know, they know perfectly what was the problem with Chagas. No? We, we drastically reduce the problem and then uh, nobody wanted to put money. <laughs> They were, yeah, we have the dying, we have a yellow fever, we have that. Let's move in from the Chagas to another disease. And then Chagas came back. So we have to be very careful uh, uh, to avoid that occurring in the Indian subcontinent. Ah, That's also interesting. Uh, picture that confirmed these uh, results of the Kalata elimination program. You see in yellow Nepal, Bangladesh in uh, brown, and India in uh, orange. And you see progressively the cases from uh, India, Nepal going down, uh, even in India, but uh, Nepal and Bangladesh have reached the point of the, the target of the elimination program. Nepal is two years ago, and Bangladesh in two, uh, more than two years, four years ago, and Bangladesh in 2016. We are, we are in these two countries under a target one per 10,000. And um, the, the recent number published for, uh, for Nepal are um, 2,040, and for Bangladesh, 2,050 cases. And just India has still 6,700 cases per year and you, we will see mm, why. Here also an, an important factor, if, if you are at the, at the Ministry of Health and you report the cases, it's a big problem to know if the data you get are really representative of the situation. For example, in India, for years, it was impossible to include the private sector. And of course, the private sector at that time was very important. It's less now because India has uh, put the decision to make free the attention in the primary health care level. Uh, people now come massively to the PhD level. Before, they used to go massively to the private sector because the drug was there, uh, the people were more present than the public sector. And that gives us a very difficult situation. You get the number from one sector, but not from the other. Uh, because you know perfectly more than myself, there were some doctors also uh, uh, going uh, around the field uh, with the drug in the pocket and delivering the drug. <laughs> but these were not recognized as official medical, medical doctors. And the government didn't want to acknowledge the presence of this guy. Uh, that's why. You, but now, we also with the elimination program, we have got what we call the under-reporting factor. That's here, under reporting factors, all the orange uh, line going down, even together with the reported cases. But that's very important. 
because we used to say we have 15,000, but first there are 40,000, 45 or more, because so many cases not reported. Now we can say that the official number I close by to the real peak, to the real number of cases. That's a great progress also. So that's just my, for my colleague Greg, I think they will <laughs> work on this, uh, tell uh, on the results, co uh, on this different component. That's the different component of the Calata elimination program. And you have the research here. But of course, it's a package that has to be very, very uh, uh, global if you want to succeed. No? You cannot dissociate the detection of cases with a, a, a good test, the treatment, the vector control. You need all these activities, social mobilization, surveillance, pharmacovigilance, and um, Greg will tell us how this has been improved in the context of the Calata animation program. That's the data I got uh, recently also the, on the achievement of this Calata animation program. You see that we are in the good way to, uh, I think, reach the global target. Now that it has been postponed at 2020, but as I said, we have to be very careful not to uh, reduce the effort and get in very uncontrolled situation. Target, as I said, Nepal has reached in two years, more than two years ago, Bangladesh recently, and in India, we have still 8% of the district that have not reached the target. But it, uh, Percent, it's a lot of population in India. <laughs> it's not a, a detail. Look, that will be the second part of my presentation. It's peak ideal. Because we have observed uh, along the years that there was a cycle, uh, we don't know exactly why, but uh, with epidemic situation and then going down, but that you can understand after an epidemic, many people die. Uh, you have immune people, who, those that don't die, they are immune. The four period of time transmission goes down. But prog progressively, you have new people entering the area where the epidemic was. You have the newborn, the babies, and progressively, the susceptible population goes up and again, the transmission start uh, and set a new epidemic like here. Yes. It was estimated between 10 and 15 years. And what, what was very surprising that in the same time, you have this post calata dermal leishmaniasis, at the contrary, going up. I have a number here. Um, for example, in India, in 2014, we had 400 cases of Picadien, and three years later, 2,000. 400, 2,000, five times more. The, the people were thinking, but does this PKDL play a role of maintaining the transmission in this period of time where they are uh, not very um, susceptible, not many susceptible people? The studies start on PKDL, and I want to use something that, that was all the research made with. Uh, I remember we were fighting in each meeting, but we are guessing that this PKDL maintains the transmission. But the first thing to, to prove is they are infected for the sample. If they are not impossible, the hypothesis is that if they are, we have to focus on these cases to cut the transmission correlated with PKDL. And that's why we did. I remember we were fighting and fighting in the meeting, especially at WHO, to say, do what we call xenodiagnosis. Xenodiagnosis is a method of, uh, I will go relatively quickly, again, the three, uh, um, before saying uh, what's xenodiagnosis, there are three major clinical forms in PKDL, macula, papula, and nodula. Look, I will go into the details. So we say, let's see if these cases transmit the disease. And uh, there is some differences between Asia and Africa. Uh, there are many more cases in, in Africa, in East Africa, um, in terms of PKDL, but they self-cure. At the contrary, in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, if you don't treat them, uh, they don't self-cure. And um, as I said, the first, first target has been to see 
are they infected for the sunfly? And there were very few data, some very old ones, the 1992, with few sunflies and few cases, four cases. But there was some indication that more than 50% of the, of the 60 sunflies got infected. And that was an indication. But recently, the paper is not published yet, so please don't diffuse the data for the moment. Um, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, sorry, um, they have uh, tested the infectivity on the 47 patients. Here they are, some nodular forms and some macular and papular. How they tested the infectivity? They use what we call the phenodiagnosis. Somebody knows phenodiagnosis? Yeah. You have heard? Yeah. It's a way to. You have to breed sunflies. You, have, you need a colony of sunflies. So of course, we cannot take sunflies from the <laughs> natural environment because some could be infected. And you breed your, uh, your sunfly and uh, put in the cage, like here, and put at the contact of the lesion, the nodules, the papule, the macula. And you see how many sunflies get infected. You dissect the sunfly. And you Another way is to use the blood and you put the sunflies directly at the contact of the blood through a membrane. And uh, what the results? That's very impressive. As I said, they are very recent because they are not published yet. The paper is accepted, but uh, they were nodular forms. They were macular, papular, to be sure that we cover all the range of the, of the lesions. And is the, the different part of Bangladesh where the, the PKDS cases were from. And they did also on VL cases, but we are more interested on PKDL in that case. And you see here, among the, the 47 cases, 27 infect the sunflies. And most of them had fed on nodular and uh, macular forms, <coughs> not, not papular. But most of them, you will see, have, uh, that's very important, had uh, skin quantitative PCR on skin positive. And that becomes to, to make the conclusion easy. Here you see the data. Collision between the clinical form of the PKDL and the positivity of the parasitic load in the skin. Here you see the same thing. You see the parasitic load in the skin in the positive sunfly uh, patient that infect sunfly, you have a, a rate much higher than the negative one. If you have the maculopapula or less than nodular forms, clearly the nodular form have a parasitic load uh, uh, clearly much more important than the others. And also the last point that confirmed the the situation, all these uh, patients that infect sunflies were positive by quantitative PCR and microscopy for the parasite in the skin. Conclusion. There is a close relation between the positive uh, sunflies and the patient who had a high parasitic load and are nodular forms of PKDL. So 27 PKDL patients, more than 50%, exactly 57.4, had positive results by xenodiagnosis. And um, skin parasite load, nodular lesions, and positive skin micros microscopy were significantly associated with positive xenodiagnosis. The study was the first correlating xenodiagnosis with parasite load in human by quantitative PCR. You see that the progress of all the, these techniques, quantitative PCR in, in skin, xenodiagnosis, that made possible this study. It took so much time, years, I would say, to get the colony uh, in, in Bangladesh. Now they, they will be replicated in, uh, in Sudan, but I think in, uh, in the Varanasi you have also now huh? xenodiagnosis uh, with, with Kamsunda and all the team. Okay, the last one on PKDL, but I insisted because it's really the first time we get the answer to, to this question. Are PKDL important? 
of what they are, of abundance. So what the consequence we have to make an active case detection on these PKDF cases, and we have to treat all the cases diagnosed uh, at the early stage, and is part of the Calapa elimination program. I think that's a great progress to achieve uh, the tar to achieve the target of this program. I want. I conclude briefly with some aspects in Africa where the situation is much complex because we have two different parasites in, Af in East Africa, the Novani and Infantum. You have different vectors. So you have anthroponotic mainly, but also zoonotic transmission. It's a very dispersed habitat, not only intra uh, domiciliar but extra domiciliar transmission. We have seasonal migration, we have epidemics. But it's a complex situation. And another factor that the relatively high frequency of the co-infection with HIV in some areas, especially in northern Ethiopia, and with tuberculosis that make complicated the, the treatment. The rural habitat in that is just an example. HIV co-infection, you see Brazil has still an important uh, rate of co-infection. Sudan, in some parts, but mainly Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia, uh, you have a lot of uh, seasonal workers that go from one place to another and go there for six months. The men are usually alone, no women. <laughs> you see the consequence. <laughs> they are some six workers that uh, take advantage of the situation. <laughs> Look, HIV is uh, still uh, active in these places. And India is still uh, it's relatively low. We were talking uh, HIV among the truck drivers along the highway that stop in certain places and then we could follow the, the HIV with the uh, stop of the drivers in some places. But I want also to accuse the, all the truck drivers <laughs> to disseminate HIV, but it was a uh, a knowledge factor. <laughs> and the last part, the zoonotic visceral leishmaniasis, completely different epidemiology with leishmania infantum, mainly children, patients. The dog has the main reservoir. And you see that uh, in red, South America and Southern Europe and part of uh, Eastern Mediterranean have uh, this epidemiology of zoonotic visceral leishmaniasis. Uh, Frequently, there are sporadic cases, few epidemics, and uh, the main problem is the dogs, how to eliminate the dog at reservoir. Well, the main problem is, of course, the patient, but uh, then it's how to solve the situation, uh, knowing that uh, Brazil, for example, has uh, used millions of methods to eliminate the dog, but no one single so far has been very efficient because if you kill the dog, the owner buy a new one. The vaccine doesn't work so far. It's very partly small protection. And uh, the dog move a lot, the disseminate the disease. And the dog doesn't die from VL, or very lately. And it's full of parasites in, in the skin. But it transmitted the disease during all the life. And it's a, a terrible factor of dissemination. Here you see also recent data that show that in red, unfortunately, is Brazil that maintains a very more than 3,000 cases per year. Uh, but here you have all the contribution of the different countries. But really, unfortunately, uh, Brazil has still uh, a difficult situation to solve. Here you see also, that will be one of my last one. Um, here, the Brazil situation co corresponding to, uh, ah no, sorry, sorry. Brazil is here in green with AMRO, American region, the Eastern Mediterranean region, because now we move, sorry, the two last slides are for cutaneous leishmaniasis. Okay, I wanted to show you that the problem currently for cutaneous, the major problem is uh, Eastern Mediterranean countries, Iraq, Iran, uh, if you go further, Afghanistan, all the countries with civil war, instability, and difficult to, to maintain the healthcare situation. I have the number here. Uh, 
Afghanistan, 35,000 Syria, 50,000 cases, Pakistan. Oh no. uh, in Africa, we have Yemen also now that is increasing because the war. But you see the correlation between uh, instability, political instability, and uh, and cutaneous I have no data from uh, North Africa, but uh, the colleague will tell us. But that you see clearly EMRO, Eastern Mediterranean country, with huge proportion of CL cases around the world. And the last one, that the teenagers, the young people, picture taken in India. Uh, I say we, we should not forget, especially you that are in basic research, sometimes you are into your interlocking, citizens, etc. And uh, I remember when I used to work in South America, I saw these cases of mucocutaneous sexualitis, severe mutilation of the face, and I made a presentation in the lab of uh, cellular immunology in the Pasteur Institute, and the chief of the lab at the end said, this is the first time I realized that we work for these people. And that the purpose of our work is not only uh, determine uh, uh, H2PH1 and uh, I don't know. <laughs> discrimination for the for this kind of research, of course we need it. But don't forget that you have at the end of the process these people that wait for your research. Thank you.